also, FCC blood drive is coming up. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on as well that didn't make it into the program. Let me mention just a few of them for you. One is our Ball State Christian Campus House collection. We collect every single year for Ball State Christian Campus House. We collect paper goods such as, um, such as uh, toilet tissue. We collect paper plates, uh, the 10-inch heavy-duty plates. We also collect 10-ounce uh, and 12-ounce cups. And so if you can provide that for Ball State Christian Campus House, our WINGS group's going to be taking those things uh, to Ball State, and uh, that'll really, really be greatly appreciated by them. And then also, we've been signing up for our Jack Rapids uh, ball game this Tuesday night. Now, if you bought a ticket or if you signed up to get a ticket, we have bought your tickets. We bought 34 tickets. Now, we don't get the tickets until tomorrow. And so on Tuesday, I will be standing at the Jack Rabbit Stadium along, and he doesn't know it yet, but I'll be standing there along with Mr. Don Garner. Don, would you stand? So people recognize. Everybody say, hi, Don. Hi, Don. Okay, great, great. All, both of us will be standing there, and we'll be passing out tickets if you ordered them, okay? So make sure Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, if you order Jack Rabbit's uh, tickets, we've got them for you at the Jack Rabbit's, uh, at the Jack Rabbit's uh, Stadium. Now, let me say this. Most of you, if not all of you, know that Acacia Academy has moved into our building, uh, we are hosting Acacia Academy uh, as, a, as, a, a, as a part of our facility. And we've been slowly, they've been slowly moving into our building over the past uh, couple of months. Now, yesterday was a huge push to get all of Acacia Academy into our building. And I got to tell you what, I walked into the building this morning and uh, I was really, really happy because things look pretty good in the building for having moved an entire school into our building. Um, and uh, I got a note this last week from Rob Hoshaw, their headmaster, and uh, Rob just noted, uh, 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 sent a note to uh, the leadership and myself, and uh, I want to read that note to you, just to let you know where they're standing. He said, just a big note of gratitude for all of you and all of Fairfield Christian Church, a note of gratitude for everything that you guys have done. You have welcomed Acacia into our new home. Thanks for your love. Thanks for your hard work. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for the space that we can call home. May the Holy Spirit continue to move us as we take giant leaps for a new amazing school year. And yesterday, they moved the rest of their things into our building. And like I said, things, well, they were supposed to move in yesterday morning, but what was it doing yesterday morning? It was raining, right? And so they moved uh, the time to yesterday afternoon and, yet, and last evening, and uh, they got all moved in, and we're really happy. We've still got a few things to iron out as far as finding homes for different things, uh, but all in all, things are just great. We uh, really appreciate working with uh, Acacia, and we really appreciate their ministry as well. And I want to say thank you, Fairfield for being so understanding, being so gracious, being so helpful uh, in this move, and I know they appreciate it as well. That is all I've got to announce this morning. Can I get an amen? Amen, amen. exactly right. Now listen, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that back in the first century, Christians were a hated people group. And because they were a hated people group, there was a pagan who was actually planted in a group of Christians in order to spy on this group of Christians. And that person who was the spy, he was in that group of Christians for well, quite a little while. He went to their services, and when he was done spying on the group, he came back with a somewhat mixed report and contained within his report well, were a lot of things, but contained within his report were these words, Behold how they love one another. Behold how they love one another. Let me ask you, how many non-Christians say that today about Christians? How many non-Christians say that today about churches? Behold how they love one another. Or, or do non-Christians say things like this about Christians and about churches? Oh, how they hurt one another. How they fight with one another. 
how they criticize one another. I mean, wouldn't it be great once in a while just to hear the words, oh, how those Christians just love one another. You see, all too often Christians get caught up in bashing one another. People get caught up in bashing one another. I mean, I, I mean you see it in politics. My sister has been a nurse for much of her career, and you see a lot of bashing in nursing. And not only that, you see a lot of bashing going on in, in factory work as well. People bashing one another. And, and bashing one another has unfortunately sipped, seeped into a lot of churches today. And rather than bashing one another, Jesus Christ wants us to love one another. Rather than bashing one another, Jesus Christ wants us to love one another, to pull together, to pull for one another, to support one another, believe in one another, care for and pray for one another. Let me ask you this, are you a person who loves other Christians? Are you a person who loves other Christians? Is your love for your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ evident to everyone around you? I mean, do you really pull for other Christians? Understand, unity today is a virtue, well, is a virtue of the past, I think, for the most part. And, and speaking of unity, speaking of pulling together, Jesus said this to the disciples back in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 34. This is what Jesus said. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One of the principles of Bible study is that if you see a word or a phrase repeated often, you need to pay attention to that word or phrase. In these two verses, what phrase is repeated often? Love one another. In these two verses, Jesus said, love one another three different times. If you want to make an impact on our culture today, our culture that's moving in the wrong direction, if you want to make an impact on our culture today, you need to love one another. By this, people will know that you are different. Now, you'll notice in these verses, Jesus didn't say, love me, although that's very, very important. Jesus said, love one another. And when you love one another, that speaks volumes to a, to, a, to a culture that's going in the wrong direction. It speaks volume to a lost world. I mean, I would love to see the day when Christians are so unified that nothing and no one can cause a problem in the church because the church is such a tight team. Nothing's going to cause a division. Nothing's going to cause a ripple. Today, you can talk to any coach you want to talk to, baseball, football, basketball, soccer, what, whatever the sport is, you talk to any coach, and they dread the day when the team turns against itself. Guys, if we just pull together, we may not win every game, but guys, if we just pull together, we'll have the time of our lives. Let's, let's work together, guys. Look at a couple of verses in John chapter 17. John chapter 17 records, I believe, the longest prayer in the Bible. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying, and this is what He says in verses 20 and 21. Jesus prays these words, I am praying not only for these disciples, His disciples, but also for all who ever believe in Me through their message. I pray that they will all be one. And this is Jesus praying, I pray that they'll all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and I am in you. Jesus is saying in those verses, guess what, God, nothing and no one has ever broken our relationship, never broken our relationship. And I pray, God, today that all believers will be one, a tightly knit group of people in love. And then Jesus goes on to pray in verse 23, these words, may they experience such perfect unity 
that the world will know that you sent me and that you love, this is good too, that you sent me and that you love them, that's us, that you love them just as much as you love me. May they experience unity. No more brother bashing, no more sister slashing, no more ugliness toward any, any other Christian, no more ugliness toward any person at all, no more ugly gossip whatsoever. Now, does that mean that all of us have the same view on everything? No. We're never going to have the same view on everything, but it does mean that all of us will have our eyes on the same goal. Our commitment will be at the same level. Our hearts are in the same place. One of the reasons some people won't become a Christian, one of the reasons some, become, some people will not become a Christian is because they have observed Christians at work in church. They've observed Christians fighting in church, criticizing in church, and you say, well, how do you know that? I've had non-Christians tell me that. Oh, yeah, there's no way in the world I'm going to go to a church like that and become a Christian. There's no way in the world I'm going to become, I'm going to become a Christian because I don't want to be a part of that kind of thing. They've told me as much. I would love to be able to hear someday non-Christians say these words, behold how they love one another. Oh, how they love one another. Do you want to see unity in your family? Dad, mom, kids, do you want to see unity in your family? Do you want to see unity in God's family? Do you want to see unity? Stop looking for the credit. Stop looking for what you want. Start looking out for other people. Put other people first. I mean, Paul talked about that in Philippians chapter 2. Now, having said all of this, Peter gives us a command. He gives us a command at the latter part of chapter 1 and on into chapter 2. And the command that he gives us is basically this. Love one another. Love one another. And don't forget that Christians are hurting. In fact, more than that, Christians are being persecuted. And it's easy to get thin on love when you're hurting. Is that not true? It's easy to get thin on love when you're hurting. I mean, they're going through a tough time. When you read through the book of 1 Peter, those people are going through a tough time. We talked about it in week one, and we talked about it in week two. These people are not living in their own home, let alone their own homeland. They're being mistreated. They're not living in their homes. And then beginning in verse 22, Peter tells them, hey, guys, pull together. Come on, guys, pull together. I mean, they're the same family, right? They're going the same direction. At least I hope they are. And so, and so how do you pull together as a church family? How do you achieve unity? There are several things that we find in verse 22. In fact, verse 22 could be a sermon in and of itself. But let's look at verse 22. We're going to be looking at some other verses. But verse 22 says this, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other. Now, there are three things there that will tell you, tell you how to pull together. First of all, they obeyed the truth. They obeyed the truth. Secondly, they purified themselves. Number three, they had a sincere love, a sincere love for one another. That's how unity happens. I want to obey the truth. I want to obey the truth. I don't obey my, obey my own desires. I don't obey the desires and the wants and the wishes of other people because if I do, guess what? I'm going to be get, I'm, I'm going to get crossways with somebody else. I'm going to obey the truth. And then he says, having purified your souls, or they purified themselves. The New American Standard Bible puts it this way. They had a purity of the soul. In other words, purity in their motives. Purity in 
their motives. And then he writes a sincere love for one another. A sincere love for one another. The word sincere, it means without being hypocritical. It means without being hypocritical. An absence of hypocrisy. Don't wear a mask. And what's really interesting, too, with that word hip, a hypocrite or hypocrisy from a, from a New Testament point of view, the really interesting thing is this. Do you know what a hypocrite was in ancient Greece? In ancient Greece, a hypocrite was actually an actor. Do you know that? If you were an actor in ancient Greece, you were called a hypocrite. And that meant that you were an actor. You were a hypocrite. You see, actors in ancient Greece, most of the time, if not all of the time, when they were on stage performing as a certain character, if they're performing as a certain character, they wore that character's mask. Or if they're performing in another play as another character, they wore that character's mask. Whether it be a man or a woman, they wore that particular character's mask when they played that role on stage. And if you want to be a part of the team, you get rid of the mask. If you want to be a part of the team, you get rid of of the mask. You get rid of hypocrisy. Understand pride and pulling together, those two things do not mix. Now, what keeps all of this strong? What, what keeps all of this together? Look at the end of verse 22. At the end of, the verse, at the end of verse 22, he says, love one another deeply from the heart. Love one another deeply from the heart. And what's interesting about this verse is this. The uh, Apostle Peter, in writing this book, he writes in this book, he uses two different words for our word love. He uses two different words for our word love. When he says a sincere love for one another, he uses the Greek word philos. P-H-I-L-O-S. He uses the Greek word philos. That's where we get the word Philadelphia from. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is the city of brotherly love. Exactly right. And that's what the word means. It's a brotherly kind of love. Now, in the last part of verse 22, he uses another word for love. He uses brotherly love in the beginning of verse 22 there. He uses at the end of verse 22, he uses another Greek word that's called agape love or agape. Love one another deeply. He changes words. You see, the agape love is a love from the heart for one another. A love from the heart for one another. Agape love is sacrificial. Agape love is patient. Agape love treats a brother and a sister in Jesus Christ, you treat them kindly. There's no room for envy. There's no room for jealousy. It's a kind of love. Agape love is the kind of love that does not seek revenge. Does that sound at all, even remotely, like 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Of course it does. Agape love. Let me ask you, do you love other Christians like 1 Corinthians 13? Do you love other Christians like 1 Corinthians 13? And you may find that when you are snippy, when you are negative, when you are ugly towards other people, you may find that your heart just isn't right. You probably don't have the other person's welfare at the front of your mind. Have you ever heard the term support group? I would imagine most of you, if not all of you, have heard the term support group. There are tons of, ki tons of different kinds of support groups out there. You've got, um, you've got divorce support groups, grief support groups, addiction support groups, alcohol support groups, all sorts of support groups out there. And do you know why support groups are so popular? 
support groups are so popular because those people need support. Those people who are struggling need the support. They need love. They need arms around them. They need encouragement to fly the right way, if you know what I'm talking about. Does the church give that kind of support? Does the church give that kind of love and encouragement for people to live a Christ-like life? Does the church do that? Do we put our arms around one another and say, I'm in your corner as you strive to live a Christ-like life? You see, something like that, saying something like that means a whole lot to someone who's struggling. They're pulling together. And I find for the most part, for the most part, Fairfield is a church like that where we pull together. In times of crisis, we wrap, our, we wrap our arms around each other. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, all the way through 1 Peter chapter 2, ending in verse 3, there are four different reminders about Christians pulling together. There are four different reminders about Christians and churches pulling together, standing united. Now, don't get me wrong. I've said it weeks ago, and I just said it a little bit ago. We're all different. We all have different views on everything. We all have different temperaments. We all have different political views. But what is it that causes us to be united? What is it that causes us to pull together as a Christian family? He gives us four different reasons, and here's the first one. We all have, here it is, we all have the same Father. We all have the same Father. Father. That's the first one. That's in verse 23. We are children of the same Father. And Peter says this in verse 23, for you have been born again. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. Through the living and enduring Word of God. You know, when you stop and think about the the human family, your human family, um, there are all sorts of different kinds of births, right? I mean, some ladies, when they give birth to their children, um, they give birth naturally, right? Some ladies, in fact, all three of my children, they were born by C-section, cesarean section. All three of my boys were born by C-section. Some have their mothers throughout their entire lives. They love them. They know them. They find support with their mothers. And there are some... Well, there are some where they don't know who their mother is. That was our daughter, Annie. She had no idea who her biological mom was because when Annie was born in Busan, South Korea, um, Annie was given up for adoption right after she was born. And Annie grew up from eight months on. Sandy was her mom. Sandy was her mom. Now, there are a a lot of kids out there, a lot of people out there. They have no idea who their father is. I mean, I mean, there are there are some, there are some whose moms gave birth to them with no anesthesia whatsoever. Some were born with a lot of anesthesia. My kids were born from a mother whose husband wanted a lot of anesthesia. I'm just saying. I mean, with kids two and three, I couldn't go in there with our oldest, but with our uh, second and third boys, uh, uh, Josh and Caleb, our twins, uh, I was right there in the operating room when they, well, I watched the surgery. I watched them being born, and I watched everything going on. It was just simply amazing. You see, there are all different kinds of setups in families today. There are all different kinds of setups in human families today. But in God's family, hear me, in God's family, everyone is born the same way. All of us have the very same father. All of us are in the same family. That is a reason to pull together, is it not? That's a reason to pull together. You're a brother. You're a sister. I'm a brother to all of you. We're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Therefore, stop letting our differences break down the family. Stop listening to the world for our marching orders. Because if we listen to the world for our marching orders, it's going to be, it'll do nothing else but create division in the church. And I'm so thankful that Fairfield is not a church like that. 
You see, in God's church, when you meet a brother, in God's church, when you meet a sister, you're meeting a family member. You're meeting a family member. We've all been born again, and we all have the same father. Now, there's a second reason for us to stand united, and that's because we take our instructions from the same book. We take our instructions from the same book. And and do you see what it is there in verse 23? Verse 23 says this, through the living and enduring Word of God. And then Peter goes on in verses 24 and 25, and this is what he says, for all people are like grass. Huh, okay. All people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Oh, okay, okay. And then he says this in verse 25, but, in contrast to verse 24, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The word of God endures forever as compared to the flowers of the field. The word of God endures forever as compared to the grass that you see outside. The word of God endures forever. I mean, you talk about a reliable source of truth. It's the Bible. That book has been the book that they've been using for centuries throughout the history of the church, and that book is the same book that we use today for our marching orders. It's the same source of truth. It's the very same source of truth. You see, we get our instructions from the same source. We get our instructions from the same book. Now, let me say this. You can hear God's truth being delivered, and it can change your life. In fact, some of you have some great testimonies. You hear God's Word, and you hear it being proclaimed. You read God's Word, and you, and you read it, and it changes your life. It changes your life in an instant. However, someone who is sitting right there next to you Right next to you, that very same person can hear the very same words at the same time, and that person can go on living an ungodly life. And unfortunately, that happens in every single church, including ours. Here's my point. You have a responsibility to hear the truth. Not only do you have a responsibility to hear the truth, but you have got a responsibility to apply the truth to your life. You have got a responsibility to apply the truth to your life. Understand, just being exposed to the truth, just being exposed to the truth won't change you. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say we take all of our chairs out of this room. We fill this room up with 8-foot, 10-foot grand pianos, Steinway pianos. And then we have accomplished pianists come in, and they sit at each piano. And they start playing in concert with one another. They start playing in harmony with one another. And one thing I didn't mention is that I have my own eight-foot Steinway grand piano as well. I'm sitting down there on the bench, right? All these accomplished pianists are playing in concert with one another. It is great. It's beautiful music. And all in unison, they all are playing, and all in unison, they all look over at me as if to say, okay, your turn. And I look at them, and I go, no way, because I don't know how to play a piano. In order for me to play with those guys, I need to take piano lessons. In order for me to play with those gals, let's say, I need to get serious about piano. And and here's my point. Just being in a place where the truth is being delivered regularly in no way, shape, or form makes you a biblically oriented Christian. Does that make sense? Just being exposed to the truth, just being exposed to the truth won't change you. You've got to apply it to your life. 
You've got to apply it to your life. If you don't apply it to your life, not only will it hurt you, but if you don't apply it to your life, it will hurt the church family as well. Now, Peter gives us a third reason for us to stand united, and that is to say we all have the same struggles. All of us have the same struggles. Do you want to know what the struggles are? I'm glad you said yes. Thank you. Do you want to know what the struggles are? Thank you very much. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Here are the struggles that all of us face. He says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Do you want to know what tears a church apart? Do you want to know what prevents a church from pulling together? There's your list. That's what tears a church apart. That's what, to, that's what um, prevents a church from pulling together. And what Peter says here, what God says to Peter is to rid yourselves. Rid? Okay, I think I kind of, yeah. What it means is this. You're out mowing your yard. You're hot and sweaty after you get all done. I mean, you're dirty, gritty, grimy. You go into the house. You pour yourself a nice, big, tall glass of iced tea. You go into the bathroom. You strip off all your clothes to take a shower. That's what rid means. You're stripping off all of your clothes to take a shower. You're stripping off all of your clothes to take a bath. And God says through Peter, rid yourselves. Rid yourselves of what? Well, the first thing he says is rid yourself of malice. How many times have you used the word malice this week? Yeah, me, yeah, me neither. Malice. This is a general word used for wickedness. A wickedness that characterizes the lives of people who aren't Christians. Let me be more specific. Sins that hurt and injure other people. And Peter says to you, and Peter says to me, rid yourself of the sins that hurt and injure other people. Get rid of malice. Not only get rid of malice, but he goes on to say, well, get rid of deceit. Get rid of deceit. This word gets to the meaning of being two-faced. Deception. Deception in order to gain what you want. A hidden agenda. And what Peter is saying here, what God is saying through Peter here is, strip off your tendency to set people up with a hidden agenda. Have you ever been on the losing end of something like that? Peter says, Christian, strip off your tendency to set people up with a hidden agenda. Here's the third thing that he talks about, and that is hypocrisy. He's talked about malice. He's talked about deceit. Now he's talking about hypocrisy. We've mentioned hypocrisy already this morning, and what it means is hiding behind a mask, acting like someone you're not, being an imposter. And what Peter is saying here, on the other side of the coin, he's saying, be the person God created you to be. Be the person God created you to be. Now, we have two other words, and they're rather significant words. The first word is the word envy. Envy. Now, when a family member, let's say a, 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 a church family member, a brother or a sister, when a family member gets to a certain economic level, when a family member gets to a certain, let's say, professional level, there may be other family members who don't get to those professional levels or economic levels, 
and they have a tendency, they may have a tendency to envy. Some family members may get to a certain level, professionally, economically, you fill in the blank, they may get to a certain level of life, and the other fam- there may be other family members who don't get to that level of life, and they may tend to envy. What is envy? Envy is hidden resentment. Hidden resentment. Someone has what you don't have. Someone has what you don't have. You will not pull together as a family if you envy your brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, let me give you a tip. I've seen this in the lives of some people, and it's really, really good. Here's the tip. Develop the skill of enjoying other people's accomplishments. Develop the skill of admiring other people's accomplishments. Develop a skill of enjoying another person's accomplishments. Here's the last word that he talks about, and that's the word slander. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. This literally means evil speaking. Literally means evil speaking. It most often occurs when a victim, no, no, let me put it this way. It most often occurs when the victim isn't there to set the record straight. It most often occurs when the victim isn't there to defend themselves. They're not there to defend themselves. It happens most often when rumor or bad news, it most often happens when rumor or bad news is going around about this person, about that person. It is disparaging gossip, disparaging gossip, derogatory gossip. Slander hurts the reputation. If you are a Christian, Peter is saying to you and he's saying to me, we need to get rid of malice. We need to get rid of deceit. We need to get rid of hypocrisy. We need to get rid of envy. And we need to get rid of slander. Those sins will tear a church apart. The church needs to stand united. The church needs to stand as one. Why in the world is that so important to Peter? Why is that so important to Jesus? Why is that so important in the Bible that the church stands together? It's important because the church is living in a world of Christians or of people who are not Christians. And we want to make an impact for Jesus Christ. If the church is fighting and fussing and gossiping, guess what? Non-Christians don't want to be a part of that. And so what we need to do is to pull together. Here's a fourth reason to pull together, a fourth reason, <coughs> excuse me, to, uh, to stand united. And that is because, here it is, we have the same objective. We are focusing on the same objective. Check out 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Like newborn babies... Well, they crave pure spiritual milk. Newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Do you know what the objective of a Christian is? The objective of a Christian, he says it right here, the the objective of a Christian is that you may grow up in your salvation, that you may grow, that you may mature in Jesus Christ that you may grow up. That's our objective as as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to the next verse, but I want to begin in verse 2. He says there, that you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Stop and think about this. The apostle Peter, along with all the other disciples, they were with Jesus day and night, virtually day and night, for some three years in ministry. They laughed together. They cried together. They ate with one another. They had good times, mountaintop experiences, and they had bad times. 
low valleys. They ate with one another. They laughed with one another. They cried with I mean, they did everything together with Jesus. And the one thing that Peter is citing here about Jesus, the one thing that Peter is citing is that the Lord is good. Or in the New American Standard Bible, it says that the Lord was kind. Peter, here it is, Peter remembers the kindness of the Lord. He remembers the Lord's goodness. Let me ask you this. What do people remember about you after they've talked with you? You're having a conversation with someone. Let's say you talk for 10, 15, 20 minutes. You just met that person. You two part ways. What does that person remember about you? What does that person remember about you? Oh, I just met that guy, and I got to tell you what, that guy was a goofball. <laughs> or I just met that guy. <laughs> you don't say this about guys very much, but man, man that guy was kind. Or, or I, just, I just met that lady, and yeah, we talked like 20 minutes, and she didn't have a good thing to say at all. Not a good thing to say. Or, or, I just met that lady. Yeah, I just met that lady and, man, she was so, so kind. So kind. We have a friend like that. I mean, kindness just oozes out of her pores. When people walk away from a conversation with you, what do they remember? Now, today, we have, I don't know, we've, We've not talked about any deep, deep level stuff. Uh, we've talked about some pretty rubber meets the road kind of stuff, some basic stuff, some, some fundamental kind of stuff, not just for life, but for the Christian life, some fundamental things for the Christian life. And um, through the years, off and on, I've heard little snippets of this piece, and I keep thinking to myself, when I hear that little snippet of that, of that article, I need to find that someday. I need to find that someday. And a few weeks ago, I found that finally. And I want to close today by reading this little piece. And this little piece is entitled, All I Ever Needed to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. All I Ever Needed to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. It's it's written by a guy whose name is Robert Fulham. It goes like this. Most of what I really need to know about how to live, what to do, how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sandbox of the nursery school. There are things that I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt someone. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Yeah, flush. (laughs) Here's another one. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Learn some and think some and draw some and paint, and sing, and dance, and play, and work every day. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out into the world, watch for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. Be aware of wonder, and remember, do you remember that book about Dick and Jane, and the first word that you learned, the biggest word of all? Look! Everything you need to know is is there somewhere. The golden rule and love and basic sanitation, ecology and politics and sane living. Think of what a better world it would be if we would all, the whole world, if we all had cookies and milk about 3 o'clock every afternoon and laid down with our blankets for a nap. 
Or we had a basic policy in our nation that other nations, and, and, and other nations too, uh, always would put things back where we found them and clean up our own messes. And it's still true. It's still true no matter how old you are. When you go out into the world, it's always best, it's always best to hold hands and stick together. It's always best to hold hands and stick together. For the family to make an impact for Jesus Christ in the world, for the family to make an impact in their world, it's always best for the dad and the mom and the kids. It's always best to hold hands and stick together. For the church, for the church to make an impact in their world, for the church to make an impact around the world, it's always best to hold hands and stick together. Do you want to make an impact for Jesus Christ in your world where you work? Do you want to make an impact for Jesus Christ in your neighborhood? Does Fairfield want to make an impact in our world, around the world, for Jesus Christ? Hold hands and stick together. And some of you might be saying, you know what, I really do need to do that. I want to be a part of that. I need Jesus Christ in my life. If you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, I tell you what, I would just love to talk to you. I really would. Sean Flannery is here this morning. He'd love to talk to you. The wife, Liza, sitting right next to him, they would love to talk to you about Jesus. Kirk Wiley, he's up in the, up in the crow's nest. Love to talk to you. Amanda, who's been playing the piano today, love to talk to you about Jesus. I would too, so would my wife, Sandy. If you want to be a part of the church, we'd love to talk to you about that as well. But we as a church, we as individual families in a church family, we need to hold hands and stick together for the glory of God. Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we? <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the chance to get together. And God, um, we are so grateful that you have loved us to the point where we are your children. God, we don't deserve to be your children, but God, you have created us, and God, you have created a way that we might spend eternity with you. And God, I pray today that... Um, we would hold hands and stick together. Or to put it in biblical terms, we would love one another. That's what Jesus said in, in the book of John, to, to love one another. And God, I pray that we would love each other, one another, through thick and thin, no matter what happens in our lives. But God, will be there and we'll love one another. Father God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.